Okay, we are now recording. This is the DAPSI Fundamentals webinar. Uh, welcome. Uh, I've been looking forward to this presentation for some time, and uh, really the purpose behind this, this presentation is just to settle things down uh, to make sure that we are following just very basic fundamental steps. And I just want to clarify because I know it's difficult when you first get started doing the DAPSI work. It can be difficult to just like jump in. It can feel overwhelmed. You know, you can feel overwhelmed, and I definitely don't want you to, to do that. We, we, we have this, this, um, this gap we have to fill. One, on one side, we have to download a tremendous amount of information, and on the other side, we have to make it practical where it's workable, where you can use it in your clinic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through about halfway through this presentation. When I get halfway through, I have Dr. Anderson, the doctor that helps us in Raleigh, Dr. Anderson is going to uh, watch for questions and answer questions, and we'll take time halfway through the presentation, and we'll answer questions, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll answer some more. So we have a number of people on the already on here, so it might take me a little time to find him and unmute it, because everybody else is, is muted at this time. So let's go ahead and get started. The very first thing I believe that's important to talk about, and I've got to hit a, just a logistical thing here real quick. Okay, good. The very first thing I think that's important to understand is that um, as chiropractors and understanding chiropractic, if you, if you understand the chiropractic principle of above, down, and side out, if we understand the, the, the chiropractic principle that the body has a self-healing mechanism, you know, there's an innate intelligence within, and when we understand that the body is a self-regulating, self-healing organism, it really makes our work a lot easier because we, we get out of the realm of trying to treat a whole bunch of things and we settle down and understand that it's really foundational, foundational elements that are going on the body that really are the biggest drivers. Let me say that a different way. What I'm saying here is there are a few things that go on foundationally in the body, such as blood sugar and things that we're going to talk about, that if these things don't go right, the body loses its ability to heal itself. It loses its ability to do all the things we talk about in the chiropractic uh, philosophy of being able to happen when the body's functioning in a, normal, in a normal way. And I really think that this is the advantage we have as chiropractic internists um, over, you know, people just doing functional medicine or whatever, because if you, if you don't, if you, if you have a hard time grasping this understanding of the vitality or the vitalistic standpoint, uh, then it makes this more challenging. Okay, so, so I want to say that. Now, the next thing I would say is this. I, I took this out of the, the Townsend letter. This is an article written by this Dr. Ali, and if you will, let me just get my little drawing thing out here. If you will, this bottom part right here, this portion right here is not really important to me and it's not really relative, relevant to what we want to talk about. And I would add to this, uh, right here, we need to put also the brain. The brain needs to be in here as well. So basically what it is, this is the base trio. So the liver, blood, bowel, brain, this is really the basis of really the physiology of the body. And when things start going wrong in any one of these, liver, bowel, brain, blood, then all of a sudden, now we start having blood sugar dysregulation, we start having functional low thyroid, uh, that thyroid loop, we start having, you know, possible adrenal problems. And then when that happens, then we start having neurotransmitter imbalances, sex hormone imbalances, and then we have, you know, emotional through the limbics, and so on and so forth. That's the general idea. Now, of course, this can be bi-directional. Somebody can have a frank thyroid problem and when they do, it can cause problems this way. So this can be that bi-directional. But by far and large, this is really our base. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I really want to get to the practical nuts and bolts of what we do. But I just wanted to explain this. This is the reason why we're always, you know, working on the cold. We're always working on the GI tract. We're always working on the liver. And we're doing these things. And I'm always wanting to get rid of infection. We're always wanting to do these things right here that are very foundational to the way the body is actually functioning. So that's the reason why a few years ago, I don't know how long it was, um, I was doing DAPSI work and these ideas, the bail them out and the principles that I put, put out here 
are not necessarily new ideas. These are, these are ideas that have been out there. But whenever I first really started honing in and trying to do the DAPSI work, I was trying to figure it out from a foundational or a, 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 a very principal foundational way, what's causing this body to go. Now the information was already out there and I learned it through the DAPSI program, but I came up with this idea of bail them out. And it was the bail them out was really, of course, it's an acronym and it's an acronym designed that first off is this. When you have a patient come in, you want to go through a checklist and you want to checklist every one of these. Now, when I say every one of these, if you notice, I have one through 10. And let me get my, uh, I need to get my uh, white out here. One through 10. So these are my, these are my one through 10s right here. Okay. So these are the ones when somebody first comes in, I am going to be addressing these right away. I, it doesn't matter what the patient comes in with. Uh, they come in with, uh, let's say they're, they're tired, they're fatigued, they have weight gain, they have, Hashimoto's they have, whatever they come in with, I'm going to be looking at because these are very foundational things that if these things aren't right, the body is going to lose its ability to heal itself. It's going to lose its ability to have this normal, what D.D. Palmer called tone, called homeostasis, whatever you want to call it, uh, but it loses its ability to, to really be uh, physiologically normal. Now out of these, I would say it has been my experience that blood sugar of all the people that I have come in, and these are people I have referred from other doctors or just patients that come in, I'm going to say somewhere between 90 to 95 percent, and I'm only leaving that out because I don't want to just say always and never because that, you know, that, that doesn't, you know, that defies logic, but I'm going to say 90 to 95 percent of the patients I have coming in my office have blood sugar dysregulation. What does that mean? That means that I better be an expert at being able to detect blood sugar dysregulation and I better be an expert at how to modulate that and get that normal in folks because I will tell you that blood sugar is a very, very important basic. If we don't get this one, we're really going to mess up. I have patients come in, it's unbelievable, but I have, and, and I'm not knocking on anybody, but I have patients that will come in that are referred from other doctors. And granted, they've got these crazy problems going on, like, like you can't imagine. I've got a couple of case studies we're going to go at the very end that are just kind of crazy cases, but I want to show you how simple it can be. Um, when they come in, invariably I'll find one of the things that's going on with them is they've got blood sugar dysregulation. So we need to start the process to stabilize that. Our body balance, this is our chiropractic work. If the brain cannot talk to the gut and the gut can't talk to the brain, you've got a problem. Um, if the brain can't speak to the body, if the brain is not uh, uh, communicating properly, we're going to have a problem. If the body is unbalanced, we're going to have a problem. Uh, anemia and oxygen, we're going to go through each one of these uh, through this presentation, but anemia and oxygen, if somebody doesn't have, if somebody has anemia and so therefore the red blood cells are not carrying enough oxygen, this person is really going to have a difficulty uh, healing up. This is a very foundational element that if you're missing this, the body's going to lose its ability to heal itself. Arteries, circulation, I put that one in there just because that when you have low circulation, you're going to have low oxygen. So those kind of go together, but I just put it in there. So I, I want to separate it because circulation in itself can be a big problem, and we, we look at that as, as well. Adrenal, thyroid, we're going to talk a little bit about that later. Acid-base balance, we'll do that, adequate sleep. Infection, uh, this is another big driver. If you were to ask me, what are, the two, what are the two things that you see most often that are causing people problems? And I would say blood sugar and infection. These are the two, kind of the top two. And I, I can't, I, it's hard for me not to put inflammation in there as well. So I'll say the top three that we see are really going to be blood sugar, infection, and inflammation. Inflammation can come from anything, but one of the sources you want to look at is food sensitivities. Now, if you're writing this down like crazy, we're going to actually go through this presentation. I'm going to go through each one of these and try to really kind of nail it down so that we can do this in an organized fashion so that when you see patients, it's not something that, um, you know, because I have to tell you, it, it, this, is, this happened to me. Uh, whenever I first started doing the DAPSI work and I really got into it 100 percent, I have to tell you, there was some levels of frustration that I had. And the levels of frustration I had was I really wasn't quite 
equipped to be able to handle some of the patients that I was having coming in. I had some moderate success with some people, and then all of a sudden people started spinning folks that I was like, oh my goodness, and I was teasing the the, the Rogers class down this last this last weekend and telling them that, that if you think that God won't send you patients that you're not ready for, he does. You get patients you're not ready for all the time, and that's how you grow. And it's through that, it's through that frustration that really that's where this bail them out thing was born with me. This is where this whole foundational thing was born with me. This is where whenever I look at patients, I do it in a very systematic way every single time because if I don't, if I don't have an organized way that I'm actually processing and seeing patients and reading their labs, if I don't have a processed way of doing that or an organized way of doing that, you know, I can really wind up in a mess. So let's, let's go forward here. I put a blank screen here because I want to give you some kind of uh, the care protocols that we develop based upon the, um, the bail them out. Now, when people, hold on a second. when people uh, come into the office, we go through uh, the, there's an order. So people come in, we do the history, then we do our physical exam, and then we order our labs. Once we do that, then we have the patient come in and we do a report of findings. And it is on that report of findings that I will use this here again, 90, 95% of the time I'll use this, depending on what the case is, but 90, at least 90% of the time, I'm going to start the person out on a 12 week program. Now, 12 weeks, if somebody has, um, you know, a chronic problem they've had for years and we're dealing with it and maybe it's an autoimmune that's just chewed them up or whatever the case may be, it's not reasonable that they're just going to be well in 12 weeks. And that's not what we're really trying to portray. So I'm trying to, I want to make sure that's, that's understood. But the 12 weeks is really for us to go through. It's the initial part of the care. And it would be great if by the end of the 12 weeks, this person is ready for a health and wellness program where we do screening exams on them. We check them every three months, six months, or where the case may be and keep them under chiropractic care. Uh, so, so whatever, so whatever the, whatever the case, you know, whatever the case may be. So I'm going to give you a basic 12 week protocol. Now, keep in mind that this protocol is a skeleton and it's meant to be a skeleton. Now, protocols are not like when we do protocols, it's not um, uh, like, okay, you just do this on everybody and everybody gets better. That's not what this is about. This is a basic protocol that you always want to hit. Now, if you don't do exactly what I'm doing, it's completely fine because you might find something that works better for you. But the idea I'm presenting here is that this is a starting point. If you're not doing anything, this is a good starting point, and then you can grow from there. So this is what I tell people. This is a 12-week program. We're going to go through three phases. Okay? So phase one, and we're going to have phase two and we're going to have phase three. And phase one is going to last two weeks, okay? And it's going to be the more intensive part of the program. So it's, it's going to last two weeks and it's going to be more intensive. The second phase is going to be four weeks long and it is going to be what we call the discovery phase. And the third phase is six weeks long and for lack of better word, wording, this is really the tweak phase. Now, so the way this looks is this. When the person first comes in, what I'm going to do in the majority of my cases is I'm going to put them on blood sugar boot camp. And blood sugar boot camp is the product that's from Designs for Health. It's Designs for Health, and it is the 14-day paleo detox. Okay. So I'm going to hold that. I'm going to erase that just in a minute. So write that down if you're, if you're needing to. And by the way, we're recording this. So you're going to be able to come back and listen to this again. Okay. So designs for health, 14 day paleo detox. Uh, that's what we get. And, uh, I, I call it blood sugar boot camp, And the reason why I do is because that's just my patient education. I want the patients to know they're going to boot camp for the next two weeks. And um, it's all about getting the blood sugar regulated. But really, you know what this thing is? It is something that helps with the blood sugar because it gets them off their junk foods. It gets them eating better foods. It gets them off the grains. But also it has a detoxing thing with the helps of the liver. All these things are happening. So what are we doing? Talking about the base trio. We're going after the liver. 
and uh, we're stabilizing blood sugar. So, so this is really, when somebody comes in, this is a very foundational thing. Now, that might not be the only thing that we do. Now, I'm getting ready to erase. I'm getting ready to erase Designs for Health there. Designs for Health and Paleo Detox. Okay, so it's not the only thing we do, uh, but anything I need to do, I'm going to layer on top of this. And I'll give you a quick example, and then we'll move through. Let's say that somebody comes in, and I see they have blood sugar dysregulation, because most people do. And then I also see that they have a bladder infection. And then I also see that they have a ferritin that's at 10, which is low, which means iron deficiency anemia. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a protocol. So I'm going to do my uh, bladder infection protocol, bladder infection protocol. And I don't have time to go through that right here, but that has been published on Facebook. Uh, I believe in the DAPSI Raleigh uh, Facebook page. You can scroll through there and look what I wrote on bladder infection protocol uh, and um, iron deficiency anemia protocol. So I'm going to go. So what I'm going to do, and I just want to make sure this, is, this, this makes sense. This right here is report of findings day. So we're starting right here. This is not the first day necessarily that came in. We've already done our history, our exam, our labs. Now we are reporting our findings. We've reported our findings. We say, Mrs. Jones, we're going to do 12 weeks, and we're going to start with blood sugar boot camp. Let's say Mrs. Jones had a bladder infection, and she also had iron deficiency anemia on top of the other things. So I'm going to add that to the protocol. Okay, and as I said, halfway through this, we're going to have questions. So if you have questions, you know, you're invited to put those in. I'm going to have that patient come back in in two weeks. So this is two weeks, and here's the two-week mark right here. This is the first two-week mark, okay? I'm going to have them come in. When they come in on this time, I may keep them on the Build Sugar Boot Camp another two weeks, or I may move them over to a veggie protein, a green, and one, the one we like to use is from Numedica. I use the, the, I think it's called Total Protein. We private label, so it may be called something else. And Power Greens, I believe that's what they call them, okay? They've got a mocha and they've got an espresso. They've got a chocolate. You've got some stuff. You've got some good options there. So now, why would I go from Blood Sugar Boot Camp to the Total Greens on, or Total Protein Greens on one person or the Blood Sugar Boot Camp um, and continue on for the next four weeks, or well, next two weeks, I'm sorry. Well, the reason why I would do that, let's say somebody is, is uh, it, they're fairly overweight, and they're doing really good on it, they're jazzed up about it, they're having a great time with it, they love the shakes, they love how they're feeling, everything's going great, I'm going to go ahead and extend them for another two weeks, okay? Now, if I have somebody that's thinner, and they've already gone through the detox, uh, then I'm going to go to Total Greens, total protein greens, but they're going to stay on the same diet. They still don't get their, you know, they're still going to be reduced on their grains. They're still going to be reduced on their, you know, they're going to be eliminated from milk. They're going to be going through the diet that goes along with the blood sugar boot camp. Now, keep in mind that Designs for Health has put that blood sugar boot camp, they call 14-day paleo detox. They put that together in such a way that they put that together in such a way that they have a diet menu plan with it. And then you can tweak that however you want to. I really lean towards the paleo, modified paleo, ketogenic, kind of in that vein, getting his people off as much sugar as possible. Okay, so for the skeleton, then I'm going to have the person come back in another two weeks. And this is actually the four-week mark, but it's, it's two weeks from the last visit. On this visit, I am going to run a CBC with differentials. The reason why is because Many times when somebody comes in, they're so inflamed that you can't see an infection when you first see them. But after you get the inflammation settled down, the CDC will actually give you a more accurate picture. Now, I may, let's say this is iron deficiency anemia, then I'll come back here. Also at that time, I'll run some iron, I'll run an iron ferritin. If somebody had a home, high homocysteine, I'll rerun it then. If somebody had something out of whack that I need to see in four weeks, I'll run it. But if somebody had like a high cholesterol, I'm going to go ahead and wait the, the you know, the 12 weeks to, to repeat that. Uh, I'm going to keep them on the proteins and the greens throughout, and they're going to stay on the diet throughout. And here's the deal. You want to have somebody restricted on their diet as much as possible to begin with, and then add foods in once symptoms begin to clear. 
because if you allow them to have this food and that food, they don't really want to do it and they want this food, that food, they're not going to respond and you're not going to know what the problem is and you'll never get to it. So, so you just want to keep that in mind. I would rather somebody quit me because, oh my gosh, he doesn't let me have gluten. He doesn't let me have uh, dairy. He won't let me have corn. You know, I can't do that. Well, if you can't do that, you're probably not going to be a successful patient with me now. But if I keep that attitude, I can assure you, I've got a lot of patients that come that do want to follow me. So um, now at this phase right here, I'm going to have them back, come back in two weeks. And either this visit or this visit, or maybe even this visit, whichever visit that that person has, uh, inflammation has been calmed down enough, I will start an exercise program on them. Okay, so, so we're going to put an exercise program on everybody. Keep in mind, it is burst exercises that really give you the best juice. That's burst exercises, meaning uh, intensive uh, um, interval training, you know, these kind of things because of uh, what it's doing to, um, to the anabolic physiology of the muscles. So, so we kind of went over that. And if you do have questions about that, I'll try to answer that. But let's go ahead and move forward. Okay, so from these early studies, it became clear that insulin uh, and its receptors are critical to longevity of species from yeast or fungi to humans. So insulin lies at the heart of the biological pathway whose main function is to affect efficiently the process to, food, to process food and energy. Here's the bottom line. If you convert food to energy, you live well. They did this by studying 100-year-old people and they wanted to figure out what the common denominator was and that's what they figured out. So be sure you know these. If you're not doing the metabolic assessment form, you have that, you've been given that. If you haven't had that, then I think you can get it off the ProHealth website. But uh, the metabolic assessment form that right there has a lot of questions. That metabolic assessment form is really designed. Um, it was designed by Dr. Krasian, and it was designed to ferret out these foundational functional problems. So make sure you know this list very well. You're going to have people circle that so that you know when they come in. When they sit, when they you see any one of these, then you're going to suspect they have a level of reactive hypoglycemia. And of course, we've shown you this one before. But, uh, you know, one of the things you'll see as a physical sign is you notice how that tongue is fasciculating right there. OK, so so that is a sign that you'll see when somebody has that low blood sugar. Um, here's also you see that fasciculation in there, how that tongue's not the jumping, but that little bitty micro movement there. So a lot of times with your hypoglycemics, just remember low blood pressure, orthostatic hypotension, those cranial nerve ne deficits we'll see. Another thing you'll see, make sure you're looking on your labs and your LD is, and that's right there, is going to be 140 or less. When it's 140 or less, this is a sign that that enzyme is underemployed. It's underemployed and that person has reactive hypoglycemia. Okay. I'm going to draw this out in just a little bit and we are a little pressed for time. So I, I will do my best to do that. Cholesterol, start looking at that. That cholesterol to uh, triglyceride ratio should be 2 to 1. So if somebody has a cholesterol of about 200, we should expect 100. The closer that triglyceride gets to 200, as it is increasing, that it represents insulin resistance. So right here, I mean, we've explained these things in depth in the seminars. And if you have questions about it, I definitely want to answer them. But for time's sake, I need to move through on this. Liver enzymes. When you see liver enzymes are high or liver enzymes are low, keep in mind ALT and AST should perfectly be 18 to 26. If you see it low or you see it high, this can be a sign that you're going to have some blood sugar issues going along with it. Usually when you have low blood sugar, you have reactive hypoglycemia, you're going to have low liver enzymes. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so just a quick case study right here. Entrance complaint, dysmenorrhea, low energy, chronic aches and pains. Patient states that she gets shaky and nervous. So what does that already tell us? She gets shaky and nervous if she doesn't eat. That tells us hypoglycemia. She reports getting sleepy after meals. This is insulin resistance. She is sluggish in the morning and relying on coffee to push it. That could be a lot of things, adrenals and other things, but it could also be insulin resistance. So here you go. We look at the blood right here. I'm going to have to change the color of my ink right here. So we see the blood right here. You see the cholesterol is 204. So we would expect the triglyceride to be about 102. 
Hers is a 198. Now keep in mind that here is a blood cell and here's the blood, or here's a cell, I'm sorry, here's, this, here's a blood coming through. Here's glucose right here, okay? Gluso, glucose is supposed to come in here and be converted to energy. That's how, we, that's how we work. That's how it's supposed to work right there, okay? Now, if these little receptors right here, these insulin receptors are like little gates, when insulin lands on that, when insulin comes over here and lands on that, it opens the door for the glucose to come in. But if those gates become inflamed and they begin to resist, they begin to resist the insulin, then what happens is glucose spikes up, which triggers insulin to spike up, which triggers the liver to make triglycerides. So when you see high triglycerides, it's most generally from this mechanism. So, so we see high triglycerides. This is going to be a representation of somebody that's dealing with insulin resistance. And then we come down here, you see that number right there, 138. So I just said a while ago, anything lower than 140 is going to be a reactive hypoglycemia. A, a reactive hypoglycemia, I should say. And just for uh, the folks that are looking at this a little closer, our TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, is perfectly 1.8 to 1.3 or 3.0. When it gets between 1.2 to 1.8, we think about sugar dysregulation. Actually, it's a pituitary fatigue, but the most common cause of pituitary fatigue is going to be sugar dysregulation. So you're not going to diagnose uh, sugar dysregulation like that, but it's consistent with everything else we see. Okay. The next thing we look at right here is T3 uptake. If you haven't had that seminar yet, the T3 uptake uh, perfectly is going to be 28 to 32. In a female, when it rises above 32, it's an indication that she has too much insulin and she has too much testosterone. These, are, these ladies you'll see have things like PCOS, and they actually have an increased risk of breast cancer. There's a whole bunch of things. Bottom line is we're not going to fix this person by trying to reduce their testosterone. What we're going to do is stabilize insulin because that's what's driving the increase in testosterone. So we we'll always want to think from a fundamental basis what's going on. In this case, it's really simple. We've got, uh, we've got a reactive hypoglycemia. So that's what we did. We went through all this right here represents everything we just talked about a while ago. And so at the end of the day, she did, of course, much much better. And we've talked about this before in the seminars, but if you have a lady that has dysmenorrhea, you always, always, always want to look. You always want to look for your low blood sugar. So, oh, let me get a, I, I got to change my ink and we're getting ready to go to questions in just a second here. So, okay. So, uh, fatigue after meals, uh, you know, all these right here, this is a progressing insulin, progressing insulin resistance. Okay. Um, so this is more what we call in the pre-diabetic phase. Okay, and um, let me see if I can uh, let me see if I can clear this up just a little bit. Okay, so we have hypoglycemia here, we have pre-diabetic here, and we have diabetic here. So what happens is when you have a type two diabetic, this is type two. Sorry about my I'm writing on screen here. So when you have a type two diabetic, they always started here. So what happens is your insulin resistance is a progressive spectrum. In other words, it gets as it gets worse and worse and worse, people move out of hypoglycemia into pre-diabetic into diabetic. So depending on where you catch the person on the scale, that's the reason why we say a progressing insulin resistance, because it's now past this stage and it's going, you know, it's going that way. Okay, so hold on a second. I'm going to plug in some power here. My computer just told me it's not liking that. Okay, physical exam, blood pressure, pulse pressure, skin tags acanthos, nigricans. This is for the pre-diabetic or that metabolic syndrome person. You're going to see that blood pressure be somewhere in many times, 135 over 85. Pulse pressure is the difference between these two. It normally should be at 40. But when it gets up to 50, it's, it's definitely getting high, and that's a sign that there's a lot of stress in that artery. It could be from clogging of the arteries or stiffening of the arteries, but mostly it's stress on the artery due to the increased sympathetic tone from too much insulin. So you'll see that pulse pressure there. And then the women can develop female, or ma females can 
uh, the, the male characteristics. They can, you know, grow hair on their chin, a little more coarse hair. You'll see a, the face kind of round out a little bit in these cases. Let me finish this up and we'll, and central obesity. So here are what skin tags look like. If you, if you've seen those, uh, that is a sign that of insulin resistance. Acanthos nigricans, you don't always see that, but if you do see that, you know that they have insulin resistance, insulin resistance. Central obesity, of course, is the most dangerous, and that's definitely an insulin resistance. And you have this, this picture here, that's, that's an insulin resistance. So what I'm going to do is I'm, on, I'm going to move to, um, I'm going to try to find, if I can do that on my attendees, I'm going to try my best to find Dr. Anderson and see how I do with that. Can you hear me? Oh, I do hear you. I don't need to find you. Good. Awesome. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, we, we got a few. So okay. I'll just take them in order, I guess. Okay. And, uh, the first one said, could uh, you review or will you review what happens with lymphocytes and neutrophils with bacterial versus viral infections? That information is not been in the, it's not in the chemistry, blood chemistry notes. Okay, I will review that. That's part of that's part of what I'm reviewing tonight. So, okay, I will review that, and I'll be happy to always review that. So, go ahead. Yes. Okay. The next one it says, uh, "How do you feel about putting pregnant females on the paleo detox blood sugar boot camp?" Uh, they do well. They do they do fine with it. Uh, one thing that we do do though uh, with our pregnant ladies, um, if they're in the first trimester, uh, primarily. I will put them on veggie protein or the total protein in the greens from New Medica. Um, so, you know, because it's really not, you know, that you've got a lower level of detoxing going on. So you, you're completely safe with that. So, um, but we've used, we've used both, but um, you know, if you want to err on the side of caution, the uh, total, the total protein in the greens do very well. Okay. Okay. The next one is, uh, can we get the bladder inf infection protocol on the uh, Kansas City Dabsy Facebook page, I guess? Yes. Uh, you know what, uh, Dr. Anderson, if you'll help me with this and might write me a note, I'll put it up on everybody's Facebook page. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then I guess somebody asked where on Facebook, so I don't know if they know uh, that they're each each city has a closed Facebook page yes. that you can become yes. a member of. Okay, very good. Is there any more? Uh, the last one, T3 uptake number, which you said was 28 to 32, correct? That's correct. 28 to that's 32 on that, and if you haven't had the thyroid seminar yet, you know, that's going to be a little more challenging for you, and we, we elaborate that a lot more in the thyroid seminar, but just for now, just for this purposes, if you have a T3 uptake that's high, and your thyroid enzymes or your thyroid hormones high and you have a hyperthyroid, then the T3 uptake is high because of hyperthyroid. But if you do not have hyperthyroid, uh, and you, which means you don't have high thyroid hormones and they don't have any of the signs of being jittery, anxious, and all the things that go with that, uh, and, and you have an elevated T3 uptake, then that's because there's an increased level of insulin. There's an insulin resistance going on. And in men, uh, or in, in women, it uh, will raise testosterone. And, um, you know, of course, the insulin, when there's too much insulin, what happens is it bothers the theca cells in the ovaries, and then the ovaries, instead of producing the estrogen, begin producing testosterone, and that's where they get the cysts. And that's the reason why polycystic ovarian syndrome is always caused by insulin resistance. So, so just think of T3 uptake as being over 32 for a woman as being you know, increase insulin, increase testosterone until we get to that point if you're not, if you haven't had thyroid seminar. Okay, anything else? That's it. Okay, very good. We're going to roll forward. I'm going to do my best to close by eight, but I got to tell you, it's probably not going to happen, but we will do our absolute best. Uh, we are recording this, so some people are out on the East Coast. You may be putting kids to bed or whatever the case may be. Uh, so let's roll forward. Okay, so we just talked about blood sugar, and I didn't really want to just roll through that quickly, but we've been through a lot of that, and I didn't want to spend all the time doing that. I just wanted to make sure that people are recognizing if somebody has diabetes, diabetes type 2 or 1, but diabetes type 2, if they have pre-diabetic, if they're hypoglycemic, um, 
this is a very foundational thing that if we don't get this better, it's going to be very difficult for that person to get better. And let me back up and say this, say it this way if I can. And, and the reason why is because it all comes back to what you've heard me talk about in the neuron theory. You know, if the brain's not happy, nobody's happy, right? It's like mama. So the brain has got to be healthy for the body to be healthy. It's the brain and the gut. Remember, that was part of that base trio that we put down there. We, we added the brain. So the brain has to have the proper amount of glucose. It has to have enough oxygen, and it has to have activation. These are the three things it needs. And I would say, I will add, this is not the neuron theory, but I will add one more thing to this, and that is we have to reduce oxidative stress everywhere we find it. So oxidative stress, low oxygen, low glucose, and no activity is a recipe for somebody's brain falling apart and the body follows. So, so that's the reason why this glucose is such a big deal because when you increase or when you decrease glucose, the, the brain starts uh, going through a process of gluconeogenesis where it actually breaks itself down. It starts involving over here. It starts involving the adrenal glands, kicking out cortisol because cortisol raises blood sugar. You know, and, and, and you get this whole loop going. You get all these loops out of whack. So the insulin and the glucose are very important. And one other thing I'm going to say about insulin. When you have increasing levels of insulin, when you have increasing levels of insulin, it will, in a woman, increase testosterone. In a woman, it will increase estrogen. Estrogen makes things grow. Sometimes ladies can't lose weight because they have too much estrogen. Uh, it will cause them to have low thyroid. So uh, insulin in higher than normal qualities, quantities will lower thyroid function, and it will increase cortisol and it will decrease progesterone. That's kind of the feel-good hormone for the woman. So, so this is a perfect storm. So what I'm saying is, is this insulin is a base hormone. It affects all the rest of these like none of the other ones can affect everything. So insulin is like this is the, this is the thing. We've got to make sure insulin is right. This is not something you want to just skip over. Uh, and then you put on top of that low glucose, high glucose, and what that does to the brain you just get a big mess. So, so don't take lightly. That's the reason why every time we start on a protocol with somebody that comes into me, I start off, we start off with a blood sugar boot camp, not because, you know, that's the only thing we do, but it's because that is most generally something that always needs to be addressed. I, I hope that's, I hope that's understandable. And I, I realized I was uh, screaming a little bit because I actually had a little spittle come off my front of my computer there. So, so I don't mean to get too jazzed up about that, but I just want to make sure people are really getting that. So well, how do you apply that tomorrow morning? Somebody comes in, they're not doing well, uh, start looking at some of the signs and say, hey, Mrs. Jones, you know what? Looks like, uh, you know, you said in your history, you told me three weeks ago when you started that you get jittery if you don't eat. Sounds like you might have some blood sugar. We need to get some labs on that. Learn how to say that word. Learn how to say that phrase. We need to get some labs on that. We need to get some labs on that. Just run some basic labs and start working through this process like we've taught, and you'll start seeing some awesome things happen. Okay, so now let's talk about anemia. We, you know, we know all the signs and symptoms right here. This is a nice, quick thing. This is what I do on a lot of people. Just look at that right there. Um, you can look at fingernails, and you'll see they can be white right here. I had a lady just yesterday that I'm going to do the case study on for you that actually had white fingernails. So and it turned out she did have, a, uh, she did have some anemia. So we can have spoon fingernails with an iron deficiency anemia. So you want to look at that. So um, if you look at your CBC, if you see, you look at your CBC, iron, ferritin, transferrin. Let's just take ferritin for right now. When ferritin is 25 or less, then this is a sign of, this is an early sign of iron deficiency anemia if your red blood cell count hemoglobin, and hematocrit are normal. So if these guys are normal, but you have a low ferritin, you have somebody who has iron deficiency anemia, and then we're going to go through our iron protocol. And our iron protocol looks like this. We use Ferrakeel. I use it from Designs for Health. It's the best thing I've ever seen to work with this. And I dose it as 2 in the morning and 2 at noontime, 
and I have them take a form of buffered vitamin C, not liposomal, buffered C. I take the buffered vitamin C, and I'm going to dose this at a half of a teaspoon and uh, with each dose that I take of the Ferrocule. Keep in mind that you have to take that to bowel tolerance. So if somebody takes a half a teaspoon and it causes them to have diarrhea or runny stools, then you're going to have to back them off. But we use vitamin C because vitamin C will help you absorb the iron. And this Ferrocule is a very specialized chelated form that will help you absorb, and it also reduces constipation. I love the stuff. I use a lot of it, and we've seen lots of people turn around like crazy with that. You'll usually see people feel a lot better within five to eight days once they, once they start that. Now, uh, our numbers on this are 13, uh, 40, and 4.3. So if we get these, any of those lower than that, then we have uh, a deficient. We have an anemia. Okay. If we have an anemia the very next thing to look at is going to be the MCV. The MCV, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm writing this out. The MCV gives me the red blood cell size. Okay. Whoops, sorry. Oh, boy, I made a mess out of that. Let me, let me try that again. Let me just try that again. Okay. So the CVC is going to show us the red blood cell size, okay? And I'm going to take, I'm going to have to get rid of a lot of this so I have room. Okay, so it's going to tell us the size. And normally, we want to see that MCV fit somewhere in that zone of 88 to 92. If it goes higher than that, that means the red blood cells are high. We think of things like, low B12, low folate, and thi low thyroid, okay? If it goes lower than 88, we think of things like low iron. If it's in the middle, we think of things like chronic inflammation. Of course, it can be other things than this, but this is just a general thought. Keep in mind, chronic inflammation can raise it lower to keep it the same, so don't just think that that's the only place it belongs. And keep in mind, somebody can be iron deficiency anemia and B12 deficient, and then it come up and look like 90. So, so that you know, so you have to put that in all clinically. I said a lot right there. We've taught this before, but I just want to get a guideline. Keep in mind, you can watch this over again. The next thing, circulation. I look for things like earlobe creases, hair on the legs, fungal toes, and just get symptoms. You do you have pain in your legs after you walk? Uh, you know, in the different, you know, different things that can come out from cardiovascular. For guys, it can be erectile dysfunction or varying degrees of that. Um, you know, so you just look at look at those things, and of course, you want you can look at your look at your labs. Adrenal thyroid function. Okay, so I don't want to get caught lost in the minutia. I did put this on here as part of the bail amount, but let's keep in mind the very first things. Let's say you're just getting started in this work, or you're just trying to start apply this work. I want you to pay attention right now to a few things only. I don't want you to get lost in minutia. I want you to pay attention to a few things. I want you to start paying attention to blood sugar. I want you to start paying attention to anemia. I want you to start paying attention to infection. And I want you to start paying attention to inflammation. And when I say blood sugar, I would also put on here slash liver GI because that's all, it kind of all works together. So, so when, when you first are doing this work, these are the guys I really want you to major on. So this is the money slide right here. When, we, when, you st when you're doing this work, and I talk about adrenals, and I talk about an acid-base balance, and I talk about this and that, I understand that that can be overwhelming. And, you know, you have to start where you can start. If you're already doing these things, then by all means, start looking at adrenals and, and thyroid and how you can modulate that and, and start looking at acid-base and how you're going to modulate that. But, but I, right now, I'm talking to the DAFC student who's just started over this last year, or maybe you've been coming for a couple of years and you just want to start jumping out of the boat and getting into this. Here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Blood sugar, anemia, infection, inflammation, and you're going to hit the 90% rule. So you're going to hit the horses, not the zebras. You're going to hit many, many cases, and you'll be, able, you'll be amazed if you're not already doing this. You'll be amazed at some of the results you see if you just start applying these very basic ones. So the adrenal thyroid, 
is important important part and I would like to address that maybe in another webinar because it's just too much to that acid base um, and here again I just don't want to just keep on putting these things off but I have put this up on the Facebook page and I'm going to give this Dr. Mike are you there if Dr. Anderson's there, yes, I'm going to post on something on the Facebook, all the Facebook pages about the acid-base balance and how to walk through that, so we have enough time to get through this. Okay, if you have somebody that that is not sleeping when they come in, and under seven hours sleep a night is under sleeping. Okay, so if they're not getting at least seven hours sleep a night, uh, a lot of times once you settle down blood sugar and get inflammation under control, get the oxidative stress, which is coming from the inflammation, get that under control, a lot of times people start sleeping better. Um, if they do not, a product that I use that I absolutely love is from Biotics and it's called Phenotropic. Phenotropic, okay? So the way I dose that is I'll have them take two one hour before they go to bed. And if, if they find that that really doesn't work, then the next time they'll take three one hour before they go to bed. I have seen a couple of people that this didn't work for, but I've used this on well over a hundred people. Uh, this is this this stuff is absolutely golden uh, for that first phase. Now I don't want to just keep somebody on that, but through that 12 week period of time when I'm really needing their body to heal, I need them to get adequate sweet sleep because it's a very important part of it. And you may want to talk to them about sleep hygiene. You know, like cutting off the TV, uh, you know, and doing doing things, you know, getting the, their cell phone away from their head when they're trying to sleep or whatever the case may be. Sleep hygiene is important, but if you need extra help in that first 12 weeks, I'm going to use the phenotropic, and a lot of times we just get them right off of that, and they're good to go. Okay, so infection. Um, this, over the past two years, have actually become one of my favorite subjects because we just see such a big deal with infection. CBC. We're going to look at the first, we're going to look at the white blood cell count, okay? I'm going to show you a couple examples, examples here in a minute. White blood cell count should ideally be 5.5 to 8.0, okay? Now, keep in mind, this is so important that there's no law that says a patient can't have more than one thing going on, and actually, it's an exception for them to only have one thing going on. Most times, they're going to have, let's say, food sensitivity, which can bump their white blood cells up. They're going to have a, a viral infection, bring it down. They'll have a bacterial, bring it up. They'll have a whatever you, whatever's going on with them um, is going to alter that. So when a person first comes in, it may be sitting at 7.3. That does not mean, I'm sorry, it's a double, a double negative. It does not mean they don't have an infection. It just simply means that you probably are seeing a clouded picture. So that's the reason why I go through four weeks of cleaning up the blood sugar, reducing the inflammatory diet, and uh, doing those things so I can check that CDC in four weeks, and it'll calm down. And you'd be amazed at how many times I'll see somebody at 7.3 or something like that, and they come for four weeks, and they're feeling a lot better, and then I do it, and it's 4.5. And anything lower than 5 usually is a chronic infection. So what happens? What happened in that case? Well, we got enough inflammation off their system that they actually felt better, but guess what? That feeling better is only going to be temporary because they've got an underlying low-grade infection going on that's going to come back to get them. So, so, uh, so let me just erase uh, this. I'm going to erase this right here. Okay, so let's back up, all right? I, I hope that was understandable. Uh, I'm going to back up, and let's talk, of it, talk about it in these terms, okay? Um, if you have lower than 5.5, we want to think about a chronic infection, okay? If you are greater than 8.0, then we're going to think about either an acute or most usually it's subacute if they don't know that they have an infection, okay? Subacute means things aren't coming out of different orifices. You don't have a fever. You, you know, it's been there for a little bit longer than the acute. It's kind of settling in. Keep in mind that a pregnant lady can have elevated uh, neutrophil, uh, I'm sorry, elevated uh, uh, neutrophils as well, but ele elevated white blood cell count. So that's the story of the white blood cell count. Now, let's talk about the, the distributions, all right? So they look under the microscope, and they're going to tell us how, what percentage you have of what. And when I look at this, I look at it fairly tightly, and I'll say that 
neutrophils, if you're not fighting anything, should be at 60% of the distribution. While lymphocytes should be at 30%, and monocytes should be at seven, uh, below 7, below 7%. Seven eosinophils should be below 3, and basophils should be below 1. Okay? So, now, if somebody comes in and they had 6.5 on their white blood cell count, and everything looked exactly like this, you know what I would do in four weeks? I would still rerun a CBC because we don't know what's going on underneath until we get some of that inflammation that's clouding our picture. And you very well may see this look like this again in four weeks, and if it does, then I'm not going to chase it down because it looks like, okay, this person doesn't have an infection. That's good. So the way the distributions go is this. Somebody asked this question. It's a very good question. It's a very important question. Oops, I hit the wrong button, didn't I? Um, Okay, let me get back on my thing here. All right, I need to erase that. Okay, so the basic schematic is this. Your neutrophils generally go after bacteria. I'm going to say generally. Lymphocytes generally go after viruses, right? Monocytes, when it gets elevated, it can get elevated in two cases. These are the monos. They can get elevated in two cases. One, if somebody just recently had a cold and the immune system just fought a battle and it overcame it and it won, then the, ele the monocytes can elevate. That's one case. So that's an acute infection. The other case is a monocyte that you look at the blood work and they have monocytes over seven today. And you look at blood work from six months ago and it's over seven. You see it three years ago is over seven. This person, I can assure you, has a chronic infection because that is a low level. It's a, it's a sign of low level inflammation that's coming uh, from that process. So, so, no, so that's what you're going to have to just root this out. So somebody has, let's say, 8.3 for an example, and they just stay in that zone, then you want to think about infection. Eosinophils are their own deal, basophils are their own deal. I'm going to talk about those once I erase this, but I just wanted to get the example. So, so somebody comes in, they have a neutrophil of 60, let's say they have a neutrophil of 64, and a lymphocyte of 26, okay? And then the monocyte's sitting at 8.1, and these make up the rest, all right? So I see that distribution right there, and I have a white blood cell count of 5.2. I'm going to think this person has a chronic infection because of the 5.2, but also because of that guy right there. And I'm going to lean towards a bacteria because we have more neutrophils than lymphocytes. It's probably not going to be a virus. Uh, it's probably more likely going to be a neutrophil or going to be a bacterial. Okay. So uh, I'm getting ready to erase all this and I'm going to start it over. Okay. We're going to erase it and start it all over. Three, two, one. Okay. All right. So going back to this, um, if I have neutrophils, if I have neutrophils that are uh, elevated above 60 and I have my lymphocytes below, below 30, I'm going to think more towards bacteria. If it's flipped the other way around and I have neutrophils that are lower than 60 and lymphocytes that are higher than 30, now I'm going to start thinking about a virus. But don't get fooled with this because your tick-borne tick -borne infections can, can actually do either one of those. They can raise the neutrophils or they can raise the lymphocytes. But one thing you'll a lot of times see with the, with the uh, tick-borne is you'll see that monocyte be elevated, and sometimes in the 10, 12, even up to 16 or 18 so if you see a Lyme disease case, sometimes you'll, sometimes you'll see that presentation. But let's go back to the simplicity of this. We talked about doing blood sugar boot camp. We talked about uh, looking for anemia. Now we're talking about infection. And if you're just starting this work, I want you to look at it very plainly, very simply. If it's over 8, I think subacute. If it's under 5, I think chronic, chronic infection. Okay? All right. If my neutrophils are high, I think it's more bacterial, and um, I am going to either do one of two things. First thing I'm going to do, let me back up, if I think that there's an infection going on, the first thing I'm going to do is try to figure out where. 
Do they have sinus problems? Do they have bowel problems? Do they have bladder problems? Is the guy that's getting up three times a night prostate problems? Going to be prostatitis? I'm going to look everywhere. If I cannot find it anywhere and it does not look acute at all, but it's chronic, this is the person that I'm going to use Biocidin LSF on. And that comes from uh, Bio Botanicals. I'm going to use that because uh, that stuff is really good at going after chronic stuff. But I also find that if I use that four to six weeks and then come back and do another CBC, a lot of times it will draw out whatever that infection is and I can start seeing it for what it is more clinically. So, so I'm going to start that. Now, if I do know where the infection is coming from, let's say it's a sinus, chronic sinus, then, you know, I might use some vitamin C, silver, um, I might do a, a sinus cleanse. There's a lot of things that I can do in that area. Uh, so, so for my bacterials, a lot of times I'll use the biocidin. But I also use, when I have acute or subacute, I like to use the liposomal C from Numedica. Lipo C from Numedica. And I will dose that anywhere from 6 up to 10 grams a day, maybe for 6 to 9 days, depending on how acute it is. I'll also add to that something called ACS 200 Silver. And I will use that at 18 sprays. Depending on how, how, how cute it is, very cute, I'm going to do that five times per day. So the ACS 200 silver, I'm going to do 18 sprays five times a day in lipo, and I'm going to put these guys together. Then I'm going to come back and check my CBC in a week or two weeks or whatever the thing may be. If I have viruses, then there's two main things I'm going to use. And these are just for people just starting. I'm going to basically, I use Viroplex from, I use that a lot from PHP, Professional Health Products, because it just has a lot of herbals in it. And I will use Lauracidin, Lauracidin. Um, and you can, I don't know what company that is. I think it's the Lauracidin people. I don't know where it is. You can call Pink and ask them about that. But I'll use those and dose, dose those and sometimes use some like that. So we just want to keep this simple. So basically, you're doing blood sugar. We're looking for anemia. We're supporting that. We're looking for infection. We're dealing with what I just, what I just talked about right there. Okay, inflammation, if you have inflammation that's chronic on a person, you always want to think about food sensitivities. Easy to do the test, and you'll see some remarkable results if you start running that test. I like running the one that we do through pink. A lot of times I do the 184 because it gives you, you know, 184. You can also do the 96. It's a little cheaper. Um, I tell you what, the way I do this, if somebody's coming into me and they're already on this crazy freaky diet because you know, they've been so restricted, but they're still not getting well. They definitely need the 184 because they're already off a lot of these foods that are in this package. But they're eating like quinoa, tapioca, and the stuff that's checked in here. So I'm going to do that one. And don't forget about this. You always want to look at this slide. I'm going to, I, I'm going to put this slide presentation up as well on the Facebook page so you can, guys can read through it. But look for indications of the catabolic process. If somebody has any one of these going on, then it's a sign that they are inflamed. The body is in a catabolic process. We use that for two reasons, to see they're inflamed, but we also use it for a benchmark, so we'll come back and check them, late, you know, check them at a later time. Okay, I just have a couple more minutes here, um, and uh, I want to, liver GI, um, I, well, I need to say something about that. Okay, so you just started out, or you've been doing this for a year or less, okay? We just talked about putting that basic protocol together, you know, we've got our, we've got our uh, phase one, our phase two, our phase three. We start with blood sugar boot camp. And then, uh, you know, we, then we go to the protein and the greens here. And we maintain the diet throughout through the 12 weeks. Okay. Now, here's a rule of thumb that's really important that I, that I, that I want you to grab a hold of. If somebody's hypoglycemic, if they're hypo, then you want to have them eating meals in between meals, lots of meals a day, and about 30 minutes to an hour before they go to bed, you want them to take a celery stock or something like that and put maybe some cashew butter or something like that so they have a little bit of something on their stomach when they go to bed. It's really important so they don't crash in the middle of the diet. It'll help them sleep. If you have somebody that has no hypoglycemic signs but they're more pre-diabetic, 
this is the person that needs to engage in intermittent fasting. And the reason why, and the way I do intermittent fasting is very easy. 12-hour fast is enough. So that means that you're going to eat your breakfast, right? You're going to eat breakfast. You're going to eat lunch, and lunch is going to be your biggest meal, and you're going to eat a light dinner, you know, because you want to go to bed slightly hungry. You want to go to bed slightly hungry. Why do we do that? Because it's a misnomer when we really say liver detox, because really the liver already does that itself. We don't need to detox the liver. The liver just needs to have the ability to do it. But what happens is people jam all kinds of food into their, into their system at 6, 7, 8 o'clock at night, and then they lay there all night, and that food's just laying there. It's not doing anything, but, but and the liver is occupied all night dealing with that food. But if you go to bed slightly hungry, now you say, well, people don't want to do that. Well, if you if you train yourself to do that, it's really okay, um, and and you'll 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 do okay. But if you have very little food on your stomach or no food on your stomach when you go to bed, then all night long your liver has this opportunity to do all the good stuff that it needs to do. Uh, it does the detoxing. So this is a major part of the process. Don't do that with hypoglycemics because they'll crash. Okay. So keep in mind breaking the fast. We're breaking the fast. We really should. I'm going to allow at least 12 hours for myself personally. I'll go uh, on every day. I'll go usually 14 to 18 hours um, every day. So, so, and I have to tell you, this is a very important key for your pre-diabetics. We've got to get that liver uncongested, and you've got to get that moving that way. Okay, so here we go. Um, uh, it's 8 o'clock right now. This is going to take me probably about another 10 minutes. So if you need to snooze off, if you need to put the kids to bed, I completely understand. But I really want to get through this case study. Uh, let's do it this way first, though. Let's go ahead and answer questions, and then I'll go through the case study. So, Dr. Anderson, do you have some questions? Uh, yeah, there's a few here. So the first one is, are there any types of patients or contraindication to the blood sugar boot camp, total greens, total proteins? And with that, it says, if so, what type of patients shouldn't do blood sugar boot camp? Okay, so I put probably 90, 95% of my patients on blood sugar boot camp. And the only ones that I don't is if somebody's like 85 years old and they're very set with their what they're doing. So I will start them off with a green and a protein from the Medica, get them off grains and alter it that way. Or if I have a child. I'm not going to put the child on blood sugar boot camp. I'll put them on pro, total protein and greens, even two-year-olds. I'll do that, all right? So that would be one case. The other case would be some people, even though the blood sugar boot camp has a pea protein, it's a yellow pea, which most people are not sensitive to, but guess what? Some people are. So you're just not going to know that until you try. I'm going to say, I don't know the percentage, but I'm going to say less than 10% have a sensitivity sensitivity to it. Um, and I don't really know, but I don't want to say there's never any problems, but we just don't generally see a problem with it. So, okay? Okay, the next is says, should the testosterone production be supported with sal palmetto in what you were talking about, I think, back with the neuron theory? And okay, thank you very much. Great question. Now, for, for the purposes of what we're doing right now is that um, if, if you have that individual question, what I would love for you to do is give me a little bit more background as why you'd ask that question. I, I'm not down. I, I want to hear it. But, but whichever DAPSI group you are, put that question up, or you can private message me and give me that. But for the purposes of what I really want to teach right here, I don't want to get too far into those weeds because I want to keep this very simple so person listening to this feels like, I can do this. All I got to do is get blood sugar going, make sure they're not anemic. Make sure they don't have an infection. Check their food sensitivities. I'm good to go. I can start there, and then I can build my DAPSI practice from there. So I'm really trying to get that across. So, okay, go ahead. And last one here, uh, what hormone levels you have for estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, the good levels? Okay, so, so here again, uh, we have, those, we have those, those numbers out there, um, and we can put those up on Facebook. And uh, let's just do that. We'll put those up on Facebook. You can put those. Put those. I, I know that uh, right off the top of my head, we know that you know testosterone for a man's 475 to 975, and for a woman's 5 to 40. 
Um, and I'm really not certain on the rest because I um, I don't have that. That's not stored in my brain. So one last one here it says: Should hypoglycemics not do the intermittent fasting? No. Oh, yes, and that was the last one that I answered. Maybe they asked that question before, but intermittent fasting should not be done by hypoglycemics because they'll crash. That that's the reason why on the hypoglycemics, keep in mind they're going to eat several meals. They're going to eat three bit three other bigger meals and then snacks in between, which are protein snacks. In between. A hard boiled egg, nuts, chicken breast, or whatever in between. Um, and we're going to have them go to bed and eat a little food right before they go to bed so that they have, um, so, so that it helps them sleep through the night and keeps their sugar more stable. And by the way, on your hypoglycemics, if they are getting shaky and jittery, that's a sign that the brain is breaking down and you're losing neurons. So that's really one of the first clinical signs that you really want to see. You want to see that patient not getting. Uh, uh, shake your jitter, jittery because when you are, you're, you're still losing the game. Okay, and uh, and the but the pre-diabetics and, and let's say you're not pre-diabetic, but you're just not hypoglycemic, then intermittent feast, uh, fasting by all means good for you because it allows the liver to really do what it does best, and that's detoxifying. And also very important for the liver is to give it a good protein. Those are the big things for the liver. So, anything else? That's it. That's it. Okay, very good. All right, so this is a patient I just had come in yesterday. Just came in yesterday, and then I did reported findings on her today, so I just wanted to keep it fresh. It's, she's actually a medical doctor. She's an internist. And uh, so anyway, she had trauma this past April where a car rolled over her right foot. So the wheel rolled over, not the car, but the car wheel rolled over it. And burning pain in her right foot afterwards. Within four weeks, burning pain spread to her, spread to her left foot, and then her right arm, right hand, and her left hand. She was diagnosed with chronic regional pain center, which used to be the, the uh, reflex sympathetic um, uh, RSD disorder, I guess that was. So additional history, diagnosed with Hashimoto's following the second child two years prior, prior. Keep in mind, CRPS is known as either an inflammatory process or an autoimmune. So if somebody had Hashimoto's two years ago, what are you thinking? You're already kind of giving it away, right? She had jaw surgery. It's amazing. One year before she started Hashimoto, she had jaw surgery. Hmm. Then she got pregnant. Hmm. More anxious following the ex accident, walks with a system of cane. When pain is at its worst, can, cannot bear putting on socks, random standing, stabbing pain, acid reflux. Hypersensitivity to touch of pain, difficulty with balance, and needs to hold a handrail when she goes downstairs. Easily startled, difficulty relaxing. Difficulty relaxing and easily startled and difficult sleeping. These are all autonomic nervous system problems. And keep in mind that the TPO, TPO antibodies, for the guys and the ladies who are more advanced, the TPO antibodies will also attack the cerebellum, and that's exactly what's going on with this lady. Um, her cerebellum's been attacked. That's the reason why she, she's losing all this balance. Pertinent physical findings, heel to toe unstable, Romberg's positive, dystiocokinesia, all cerebellum signs. Enlarged thyroid, tongue deviation with fasciculations. You know, it's our blood sugar, low blood sugar. It's kind of funny. I told her she's internal medicine. I, so I said, I think you have low blood sugar. That's one of the foundational elements that's causing you to have problems. And she had saccades, saccades, which I think was related to that and cerebellum. She had posterior cervical chain, uh, lymph node chain. I'm sorry I didn't put that in there. Right? I typed it too fast. Lymph node chain. So what do we think? Maybe she's got a low-grade infection. Maybe not. We'll have to check that out. Impacted eardrums and hand and feet temperature cool and the rest. That's a sympathetic deal. Okay, so here's what she filled out. Um, let me uh, let me get my ink going here. All right, so uh, severe burning pain. Uh, she's on Lyrica and she's of course she's on Levothyroxine. She's on a whole bunch of stuff here. She also has reflux disease and so on and so forth. And she filled these things out. Crave sweets during the day, irritable meals are missed, agitated and easy upset, poor memory, you know, all these things are, are my low blood sugar. These are my more pre-diabetic signs right here. So so she's she's kind of off the, you know, she's off the, you know, not off the chart, but she's having trouble with these things. So I just want to show you this. Let me back up. If you're not doing this metabolic assessment form, you really need to start doing that. So then we see some labs. Uh, cholesterol that is not really a two-one ratio, but it's not a. This is not a fasting, 
So that triglyceride might be bumped up because of that. So I'm not going to put too much stock into that. The first thing I do see, though, is that BUN is low. Remember, BUN should be 13 to 18. And when it's low, keep in mind that protein, when it breaks down like it's supposed to, it converts into amino acids and nitrogen, which is the base of amino acids, which goes to ammonia. And ammonia goes to the liver and is converted to blood, urine, nitrogen. So if you're not doing that, that means the liver is congested. Now, this was also a very important one is creatinine because creatinine is a waste product from muscle metabolism. So what happens, as we've talked to you guys before, that when somebody has inflammation, they have to have a lot of fuel to make that work. So they start stealing protein from different places, and one of the places they'll steal it from is the muscle because protein is converted to glucose, which is quick fuel. Okay? So when you have a creatinine that's lower than 7, and that's 0.56, that's a sign that there's some protein loss because there's not as much creatinine, meaning there's not as much muscle metabolism going on. So she's, she's, she's eating herself up to get fuel to fight this inflammation. Um, LD, we already talked about that, and that's kind of good because I told her she had, I thought she had hypoglycemia from what I could see, and then I showed her this. Now, the funny thing about it was I was going through this, and I explained functional ranges versus clinical. And she's like, okay, I understand, I understand. So I started going through it, and she's like, well, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. And finally, about halfway through the, the process, she's like, ah, I understand. Okay, I got it. And so she's, she's all on board now. But, of course, reactive hypoglycemia, right? So what do we have so far? Let's break it down. Let's get rid of this because let's forget about all these problems she has, you know, because it actually would be helpful. When you have patients that come in, take all their information, but then forget about how bad it is and just try to start looking. Don't get me wrong here, but start looking at the foundations. She has a congested liver. That's one thing. She has hyper reactive hypoglycemia. She has elevated liver enzymes because she's probably on drugs. You know, she's taking all the medications. Her white blood cell count is 7.1. So that's really okay. Um, but look at this. Neutrophils, 60, 30. She's got an infection going on. Now, could inflammation do this? Yes, it could, but highly unlikely doing it. This has got to be an infection going on. As a matter of fact, after questioning her and looking in her ears, I found out that she has a sinus infection that's been going on. So guess what? We've got to get rid of that. All right. So basically, we did a urinalysis, and the iron was okay, ferritin's okay. Anytime C-reactive protein is above one, we know we have too much inflammation. She's almost out of the clinical. She's had a lot of inflammation. So let's just back it up, okay? Very simple. Let me get my thing. I'm going to tell you what we're going to do here, okay? Of course, she's a traveling patient. She's actually from Salt Lake City. So um, one of our doctors from Arkansas actually sent her up here. So Anyway, she's, I'm a, she would be on a 12-week program if she was, I was able to see her more often. I'm not going to be able to see her more often. So what did I do? I started her on today. Started on blood, sugar, boot camp. I know she had a sinus infection. So I, uh, uh, we went through a sinus cleanse on her. And I'm going to, Dr. Anderson, I'm going to put that up on Facebook. Uh, I put it, and then I gave her ACS 200 silver and 10 grams of lipo C a day. It's kind of funny. She's an intern. So I said, I said, I'm going to put you on some vitamin C. She said, oh, I'm taking vitamin C. I'm taking 500 milligrams. I said, uh, okay, I'm going to put you on 20 times that much. How, how's that? So anyway, so she's going on 10 grams of lipo C. She's going on the silver. We did the sinus cleanse. And this right here is going to do that. We also did a 184. Uh, we also did a 184 um, food panel on her. That's going to come in in two weeks, and she'll start watching that. In the meantime, I took her off of gluten and dairy. I took her off of gluten and dairy. And, oh, no, actually, I took her off all grains. I took her off all grains and all dairy, and we have her following the modified paleo. Okay? And uh, you know what? She's going to do fantastic. She will. She'll do very well. Uh, we won't have any problems with this, with this case. So, but anyway, um, blood sugar boot camp, you saw how crazy this case looks, right? 
all of, you know, blood sugar boot camp, get her off gluten dairy, get her off the grains. I did the food sensitivity. She's going to follow that. And in four weeks, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to come back and I'm going to check that CVC and I'm going to be looking for other infections that are going on. And then I'll just uh, do whatever I need to do as time goes on. But just doing these things right here, we're going to see a very nice turnaround in this person. Okay, I'm very sorry that we ran so late. Do we have any late questions, Dr. Anderson, before we close this? Yeah, there's no more questions right now. Well, I have to say, I am so impressed because we started out with 41 people in attendance when we started this program, and right now we have 40 people still here. Now, you never hear of that. That speaks to you guys. That speaks to you. I'm talking to you on the computer. It speaks to your dedication. I'm here 20 minutes long. I'm so sorry, that, but I wanted you to have this information, and maybe we can do some more of these webinars, and we can break it out where I'm just doing chunks and pieces where I'm not trying to cover everything, and we can do it more relaxed and less at a speed you know, less of a speedy pace. So anyway, um, anything else, Dr. Anderson? Uh, that's, it. that's it. Okay. Did you enjoy the presentation? Yes, very much so. Awesome. awesome. Okay. All right. Very good, guys. And we'll talk to everybody very soon. Get on your Facebook pages tomorrow because we're going to be burning it up. All right. Very good, everybody. Thank you.